Uh, good, good afternoon uh, to all of you joining us here uh, at COP28 um, and also online. Um, we're, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session. Um, we're at the uh, Global Decarbonization Accelerator Pavilion, which is the big initiative being launched today here at COP28. Uh, thanks to the Global uh, COP28 Energy Transition Team and to the Atlantic Council Global Energy, woo, the Global Energy Center for having us here at the GDA Connect uh, Pavilion uh, for today's discussion. Uh, these discussions are being live streamed and they're going to be published on the Atlantic Council, Council webpage. Uh, please visit the webpage for more details about the GDA Connect agenda and to view the recording of these sessions. Now we can begin. I'm uh, Bill Spindle. I'm the senior uh, global correspondent for Cypher News. We cover the energy transition um, and I'm here with three great guests to talk about uh, AI and climate change uh, solutions. Um, we have from my left, your right, at the end, Noel Bakhtian, who is the director of tech acceleration with the Bezos Earth Fund. Uh, next to her is Antonia Gavel, the global director of sustainability and partnership at Google. And to my immediate left is David Sandelow, the inaugural fellow at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Um, and from here, we'll, we'll take it away. I've sat in a number of these sessions on AI, and um, one of the big questions that I think we're all struggling to get our head around is just how transformational is this going to be, both in, is AI going to be both in uh, generally, but, but particularly for climate change. And I sometimes feel like uh, it's presented that if we were having a, a panel discussion like this back at the dawn of time uh, before civilization, we'd be saying, so this wheel thing, it seems kind of interesting. My kid loves to drive it around the, the lawn, but it, but it seems like there's more we could do with this. The wheel, electricity, totally transformational. The other end of the spectrum, when you look at some of the um, applications, the very specific ones, I sometimes feel like it's, well, this is something we could kind of sprinkle on uh, and it'll make a solution a little easier to, to come up with, maybe like MSG or something like that on a recipe. Uh, maybe just start to give a sense of how transformational do you think this is gonna be in the climate realm? And we can start with Noel at the end. Is this, is this totally transformational, something that's gonna really change the way we approach everything? Or is it really just a little tool we can use here and there to solve some, some specific things? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Noel Bakhtian from the Bezos Earth Fund. Uh, it's really great to be here. I, I really appreciate the invitation to be on this panel. Uh, before I jump into the answer to that, I thought I'd just take a moment to introduce the organization and how we think about AI in our organization. Uh, so at the Bezos Earth Fund, we are a $10 billion fund uh, targeted towards nature and climate with an uh, underpinning of equity and justice uh, to be spent by 2030. And one way I think I can start to answer this question is if you look at our website, at the people in our fund, uh, you'll see about 35 of us and you'll see we have Kelly Levin there who is the chief of um, science, data, and systems change. So you hear data in her title. We also have a director Amin Ra Mashariki, uh, who's our director of data strategies. And then you have me, who's the director of tech acceleration. So what you can probably see pretty quickly is that we really value, and one of our principles is that, that our decisions are driven by data and science. So I, I like to get that out first. Um, we have an AI initiative, and we're excited about it. We're building it out right now, and it's all about uh, collaboration and building on all of the great work that's already going on. Um, we have some partners that are in the middle of doing a massive landscape assessment uh, that's going to be made public. And we're ex also excited to be able to very soon be able to um, look at and work with the frontline communities that are the ones that are actually using AI to solve massive nature and climate challenges and help them with some funding to 5x, 10x, maybe even 100x what they're doing. And so to specifically answer your question, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that we ran a workshop a few weeks ago that was all about what are the 
what are the challenges um, in nature and, and climate first? And then what are the superpowers of AI that I think we're going to get to in a little bit? And therefore, what are the opportunity spaces where it really makes sense for us to be matching these things and actually applying AI? And we came up with something like 60 amazing opportunity areas. And so the way I think about it, honestly, is that it is a massive opportunity. In fact, if, if we're not thinking about how to apply this the right way uh, to 5, 10, 100x the solution space, then we are doing this completely wrong. And I think what we're going to hear today at COP is all about acceleration, and that's what we need to be thinking about this. For. Thanks. Antonia, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely happy to, to build on that. I mean, coming from Google, Google has been an AI-first company for, for many years, and I think building on what you said also, very much a data-driven company. So one of the things that we asked ourselves um, was what, what is actually the opportunity space? What is the scale of opportunity to actually take AI as one tool, as you say, amongst many others that we need to drive forward to tackle climate change to really help accelerate in the near term? And I think that's also one of the things that I see as unique is like we can apply and accelerate a lot of these opportunities today to help drive that 2030 target as well. But we, we launched a report a few weeks ago in collaboration with BCG to kind of try to answer that question. And what it found was by looking at existing AI solutions across a range of industries, um, if we apply those at scale, there's the opportunity to help mitigate from 5 to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, which is not insignificant. That's basically the size of the EU's emissions today. Um, so to answer the question about the scale, quantifiably, there is a pretty significant potential. Um, but at the same time, we, we are in the early stage of deployment. And we can talk about some of the use cases that we already see that are demonstrating real and measurable impact across a couple different areas, like information, optimization. How do we optimize existing systems prediction? How do we use technology and data to predict impact? So it's mitigation, but also adaptation, I think, is another part of this story that is is really important um, as well. So, so yeah, so I think there, there is a significant opportunity um, and, and we're certainly now looking at how do we actually unlock some of that potential as well. Yeah, that BCG report um, with Google is, is one of the, the best ones out there. And David, you're, you and your group it did another great report on, on AI, in specifically in the climate realm. In terms of sort of how big a deal this could be, what did you guys find? Uh, and thanks, tell about your report, uh, this, uh, Thanks, Billy. I, I agree with, uh, with Antonia and Noel. This is a significant opportunity, and, and that's what our report finds. Our report is going to be released tomorrow in the Japan Pavilion. It was supported by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry uh, in, in Japan as part of the ICEF Innovation Roadmap Project. Uh, and we looked at six different sectors uh, specifically for the oppor opportunities in greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, and, and the sectors are the power sector, the manufacturing sector, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, materials innovation, the food sector, and road transport. Um, and across all of those areas, there's tremendous potential. Uh, and it varies, I think, from, from some topics in which AI can be transformational. Uh, and materials innovation, I think, maybe is at the top of the list. Um, you know, when, when Thomas Edison uh, invented the light bulb or was at the long line of people, end of a long line of people who were working on the light bulb, he physically took different metals and ran electric charges through them to figure out kind of what produced the most light uh, and the least heat. Um, and it took him months to do this. Today, AI machine learning tools can simulate a million of those in a second. Um, and with chemical, you know, um, uh, constraints, you know, figure out what, what would make the most kind of structure because they figure out what would make the most sense. That has tremendous opportunity for innovation in the energy space and in many other spaces as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that type of opportunity, very transformational. And, and then meanwhile, I think it's hard to imagine operating a, a decarbonized, decentralized, two-way electric grid without machine learning tools. So it, it's essential. I think machine learning tools are essential for some of what we're planning on doing in decarbonizing the world. Yeah, and maybe start with Noel, but also Antonia. What what does AI do so well to have that the kind of impact you're talking about? Go ahead, Noel first. Okay, well, I just wanted to add one thing to what David said, if that's okay. Just sure. to jump off what he was talking about, the materials, to give an example to bring that to light. There, If you think about um, batteries, uh, there's actually a, a big push right now to um, be thinking about new battery materials. 
uh, especially A, to think about solid state batteries to be safer, but also to be thinking about the critical uh, materials that are in there, lithium, um, cobalt, et cetera. And so there's this major push to start inventing new uh, battery materials, and that's actually very hard. Uh, and, and the example I'm going to give is there's a group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is one of the Department of Energy's 17 national labs um, in, in the U.S. And they actually have this, this lab they call the A-Lab. And they're trying to think about how to apply AI to make this, instead of taking months to go from um, you know, using the, 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 the materials um, database to pick some things and then actually create them, like molecule by molecule, like in a foundry type way, and then test it, which could take months. They actually have this lab now where they're not only using natural language processing to scour the, you know, the, the literature um, and then using the AI to actually do all these calculations to figure out what's the most likely material candidate. But then they're also using these robotics that are actually able to do this 24-7 so that it can supplement what the researchers are having to do. In days now, they can actually test something that before took months. And you have to test a lot of these before you find the, the right battery material. So this is like one ex exciting example to th yeah. that, that David was talking about. So thanks for that. Um, I'm going to let you go first from Google on, on what AI does. Well, I think you also answered the question in the sense that it is about how do you take an incredible amount of data that is distributed, put it together instantly, and b draw insights and, and findings really, really quickly from that. And I think the question then is, okay, so what are you actually going to do with that information? Like, how do you translate that um, insight into something useful and actionable? Um, and this is where we think about it in, in three key pillars, specifically when it comes to climate. So information is one. Um, so just as, a, as an example, uh, we have Google Maps. In Google Maps, we've created something called green routing, which is about trying to bring information to people, all of us looking for um, directions from point A to point B, yes, to get you there as quickly as possible, but also to do it in the way that helps to reduce emissions. So it offers you an opportunity to, to take an alternate route um, if it's not already the fastest route to get to your destination that also reduces emissions. And so that is about kind of pulling a whole bunch of data together and adding layers that, that look at mitigation when it comes to climate and then providing that as information to, to individuals like us to ideally kind of encourage, um, encourage one to take that, that option if that feels like the right solution. So it's, it's on one hand the ability to kind of do this type of analysis but then translate it into information that is helpful and use, useful to people. Um, and that can also obviously be used in many contexts, in the industrial context when it comes to optimization as well. Um, and, and equally um, in, in looking at sort of forward prediction models. Um, just briefly, another example, um, adaptation. We are in a world of climate impact today, right? So we talked about mitigation. We live in a world where climate impacts are being felt around the world, um, unfortunately. And so we also need to recognize that those impacts are, uh, are significant. And so how can we start to provide tools that enable people to respond um, as quickly as possible? So again, using AI, our research team has produced a tool called Flood Hub, which is in partnership with the WMO who, and others who have incredible data sets in order to provide forward prediction um, of flooding up to seven days in advance before they happen in, in over 80 countries around the world to enable people to respond quickly. So it's again, it's not about, in that case, not only about real-time real data, but forward prediction data that helps provide information that enables people in that case to respond to minimize damage to property and infrastructure as well, so that for me is like the exciting opportunity space is is bringing kind of data to insight to action, um, and that's what I think AI has the potential to do quite uniquely in in this space. Just yeah. to build off of what uh, Antonia is saying, I think one way of thinking about this is that AI gives the ability to predict, to optimize, and to simulate. And, and uh, um, Antonia has given some great examples in each one of those uh, those areas, but but. Um, for, for any of, of those, you need data sets. Um, and that is a significant constraint, I think, right now in our ability to use AI. Um, one of the things we find in our report is that the, the two most important constraints in using AI for climate change purposes are one, a lack of, da of data sets, and two, a lack of skilled personnel. Um, and because those data sets don't exist at the size that AI could be useful, or they're not consistent um, across different areas, or what's? Both those things. In some places, they don't, don't exist. Sometimes they're not digitized. In other places, they're not standardized. 
Um, and so a lot of work needs to go into the development of, of large standardized data sets in a number of areas. And just to add to that, um, one way that uh, Amin talks about AI in the, is uh, speed, scale, precision, accuracy, and efficiency. That's what AI can bring to our processes. And in this uh, workshop that we did with the, the report that's also going to come out very soon, um, we illuminate some of AI's superpowers that could be particularly useful for nature and climate. And I just pulled some of them up. So one is the multi-objective optimization. And what's really interesting about this is using AI-aided optimization algorithms, you can start to think about trade-offs uh, much easier. So it's not just you know thinking about the science and technology, but now we can bring in the economics of it. We can bring in the uh, equity pieces of it as well and start to think about those objective functions. Another one is data management of sensor-generated information. You can imagine the terabytes or petabytes of, of data that are going to be coming in from all the sensors that we need uh, for decision making and, and just to understand what's going on in the actual world. And AI can be very useful there. We talked about autonomous uh, experimentation already, so I won't go into that. And the fourth, fourth one of the whole list I'll mention is model-based chat GPT applications. I actually had the great uh, fortune to meet one of my personal heroes, Catherine Hayhoe, at Climate Week this, this year. And she was talking about, I, I asked her straight out, if you could do anything with AI and, and nature and climate, what would you do? And she was talking about a chat GPT that was like a Catherine GPT where people could ask and it, it could go back and look at all of the stuff that she's published and, and, and some of the records that she thinks are really relevant. And it got my mind spinning. And I was like, we need a nature GPT. We need a climate GPT for the world. And here at COP, it seems very relevant. So those are the four I wanted to bring up for superpowers. I, I, just, just to build on, on that concept of, of kind of like, how do you bring data together and make it very easily accessible and also intersectional data, right? So climate data with economic data, um, with health data at a locational basis. And I just want to mention a, a tool that we launched actually in climate um, during climate week with the UN is called Data Commons, which is basically a little bit of a little a different dimension of that is to say, how do you take publicly available data that exists in, in sources, you know, from the World Bank, you know, there's data that exists in public sources that is incredibly distributed, to your point, is the data, but also the ability to find the data and bring it into the right place. So Data Common tries to do that, find all of the distributed publicly available data sources, bring them into one place, and make it analyzable easily by also adding a layer of um, LLM to it. So you can ask it questions and surface information. And, and I think the interesting thing for me, I have a bias because I'm an economist by training, is it brings together um, you know, the economic data when it comes to, for example, you know, a, a country, country economic data or even city economic data. How do I layer that with information about um, you know, climate impacts? How do I layer that with information about the health of, of those communities? to have a multi-dimensional uh, decision-making opportunity, for example, when it comes to policy-making, right, at a local level or to informing and educating citizens in those, in those communities um, as well. And so this idea of being able to not only centralize, bring data together, but also draw information that can have helpful implications also when it comes to policy design, I think is another opportunity that, that maybe we haven't touched on as much, but certainly one um, that I think is important. You talked about also the, the skills part of this as well. I think will require a lot of skills development when it comes to um, the ability to actually do that analysis as well as convert that analysis into, for example, policy design um, as well. Um, you know, ChatGPT was released November 30th, 2022, e exactly one year before the launch, the opening of COP28. And it's just amazing how much ChatGPT has changed the dialogue around the world, not just about AI, but kind of about everything. And um, I think one very interesting application of AI in the climate space involves large language models. Um, and this has had an impact in my life um, I do, uh, because I do a lot of work uh, with Chinese climate change policy um, and have a star student in the audience actually working on this. Um, and. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I used to hire Chinese graduate students, native Mandarin speakers, to help me translate um, long Chinese language documents. Um, five years ago, when I wrote a book on this topic, if 
there was a Chinese language document in an HTML website, Chrome would translate it, but not that well. And I, I would have native Mandarin speakers read it, and they would say it needs these types of corrections. Today, with Google Translate, thank you, uh, I can upload a 100-page Chinese language PDF. A second later, it gives me an English language document that native Mandarin uh, speakers read and say, no, that really doesn't require any correction. That basically got it about right. Um, and so I think those types of the large language model and the translation tools that are part of, um, are transformational in human communication, and that has going to have potential. That's going to have impacts in the climate change world as well. Um, I, I, I um, was in um, a ministry of a developing country about nine months ago, and was really struck at the lack of English language capabilities in that ministry. I think having you know le uh, language translation tools are going to make a big difference for developing their capabilities of understanding. Uh, the dialogue globally. And I think actually it could go the other way too. I think with the language translation tools we have right now, indigenous knowledge may be more accessible than it ever was um, uh, as a result of the lack of language barriers and that could help the world in a number of different ways. So there's, uh, I think a lot of potential with large language models to help with climate change. Can I just double click on that um, indigenous knowledge thing? In, in this workshop that we did, we, we deep dived on eight of the ideas that the folks at the workshop wanted to really dive into and one developed into exactly that, advancing climate justice through decolonization of data. Ah. And it was all about this indigenous knowledge, and there's a language piece, but there's a, like a informational piece as well, and bringing that knowledge and integrating it and making all of our solutions stronger for everyone. So I'm, I'm really glad you said that, David, that's great. And there's, there's a great organization, I don't know if you've all heard of it, Climate Cardinals, um, which is run by a, a young climate activist, Sofia Kiani, who, who basically has sort of leveraged some of those tools, basically taking the IPCC reports and scientific information using like Google translation tools to be able to translate it into languages so that people have democratized access to climate information, which is sort of part of their, their vision is how do, you, how do you make sure that people around the world have this information um, and also then can be part in that case of a movement to be able to kind of act upon it as well. So I think indeed that point about translation, access, democratization of information access is so important um, in this conversation, certainly. So uh, obviously huge potential upsides, lots of things you can do with it, um, but all, and challenges, but also potentially some pitfalls. I mean, I know uh, AI is hugely energy intensive to begin with. Did you guys come across or think about that in your studies? Let me start. Um, yes, we did. Uh, we uh, looked, did a pretty deep dive in the, re the literature on this, um, and, and my summary is, Today, uh, AI is not producing a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, um, that, um, although the data are very poor. Um, there's a, a, nature, a, a nature paper is published that, that says that data centers overall in the world are, using, are, are responsible for about 0.1 to 0.2 percent of emissions, and the best estimate is about 25 percent of that relates to AI. Um, so today it's not large. Um, and in the future, what our study concludes is the range of uncertainty is enormous. And it is possible that emissions from AI-related activities will actually go down in the years ahead. It's also possible that it will increase dramatically in the years ahead. Um, and it depends upon how a number of different trends relate to each other. Um, first, it, it is almost certain that the use of AI is going to increase exponentially in the years ahead. That seems. Uh, it's certainly a consensus projection. Um, but it's also the case that the efficiency of the hardware related to AI will likely improve significantly in the years ahead. And the efficiency of the software too, of the model development, may improve dramatically in the years ahead. Um, and then at the same time, the hyperscalers like Google um, and Meta and, and uh, Microsoft um, that operate the major data centers are the world's largest purchasers of clean energy. Uh, and so just because data centers are increasing their energy use doesn't mean we're going to have a lot more greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. So what I, 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 I spent some time this summer trying to figure out, okay, can I make a projection based upon all these trends? And my conclusion was the range of uncertainty is just so enormous um, uh, because we don't know how quickly AI is going to grow. We don't know how quickly the efficiency of the hardware and software is going to improve. Um, and, and, but as a result of that, we need to pay attention to making sure that as AI grows, 
we don't have dramatically increased emissions, and that means policy intervention, that means making sure that we have improvements in the efficiency of hardware and software. Everything David said, we said the same. <laughs> it was interesting because our studies were done basically in parallel and so I was like, oh, I wonder if they're finding the same thing and it was exactly the same thing and it was exactly yeah. the same sources of data and information in terms of the analysis that was available and the same conclusions. You know, it's, the, it's four factors that, influence, that will influence that projection, which David said, kind of the source of the electricity, the power, which is very locational. It is very locational, which is important to note. Um, it is about the, the infrastructure, so the data centers themselves and the extent to which they are efficient and as efficient and operated efficiently as well. So it's the technology plus the operation. It's about the model design, so how are modelers designing their models and how efficient are those? And then it's also about the use of the models, right, which is an important dimension. How are we actually using these models? Are we using them to help mitigate um, uh, uh, or other uses as well? So, so these are all vast um, areas that can influence that future, the future is uncertain in that sense as well. And there needs to be more research. I think that was one of our conclusions is we actually need more research to understand what those scenarios look like. Um, and, and we do as Google have a commitment um, to obviously purchase, as you said, continue to purchase carbon free energy, um, net zero commitment by 2030 uh, to ensure that that 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 current GHG emission um, scenario kind of continues to be uh, as small as it possibly can be as well. So it, it is exactly the same findings. And there are policies that one can also put in place to help uh, encourage that as well, right? Be it looking, governments helping to encourage that the technology that is put in place is as efficient as possible, that the renewable in the renewable um, generation in markets where there are data centers is decarbonized at the grid source, which requires an enormous partnership um, to be able to actually achieve that as well. So, so it is about AI, but it's also about the broader energy system and the infrastructure that, that is required and the policies required uh, as well. So yeah, very similar. And how about, the, you can add to that if you want, but also just maybe throw another question in there. What about sort of, uh, are there any particular uh, privacy concerns as this grows with data sets? proprietary information and, and also, you know, AI is obviously an area of geopolitical competition that in some ways hinders the, the sort of collaborative, uh, you know, attempt to solve the global warming problem. Well, I'm going to let David answer the geopolitical one, but um, one of the ways we're thinking about it is we're thinking about environmental, we're thinking about the ethics of AI, and we're also thinking about the equity of AI. And in this workshop that we did, one of the quotes from Lauren Bennett at Esri was actually, are our AI models and proposed solutions going to propagate existing inequities? And so that's something we need to be thinking about um, as we go. So back to you guys for the geopolitics. Uh, I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do privacy first. I mean, yes, there are privacy concerns. There's privacy concerns, I think, uh, almost any time AI is being deployed. Um, with massive data sets, and there's risks of, of uh, identities being revealed, there's use of, there's risk of surveillance, and, and that's true in this context as well. In, I mean, in some applications, like utility applications that draw upon customer data create risk of privacy, and, and so you need to pay attention to protecting privacy um, in, in the course of doing this. Probably less privacy issues if you're simulating battery chemistry, but. Um, but certainly with utility data or anything involving customers and businesses. Um, yeah, and the geopolitics, uh, that's a whole big topic. Um, I, th this is a major area of competition between the US and China right now. Um, uh, technology broadly, uh, AI hardware in particular chips. Um, uh, I, I am encouraged by the agreement that Secretary Kerry and Minister Xie Zhenhua reached um, uh, several weeks ago in terms of US-China climate cooperation. Um, I, I don't think this is an area where we're going to see significant cooperation just because of the challenges in, uh, in the technology space. So looking forward, where do we kind of go from here in order to maximize the benefits and, and limit the downsides of this? What, what is sort of needed uh, going forward and kind of in what stages do we need? We talked about more training and more trained people. That's clearly one. What else do we need? Computational power, policy uh, changes, or, or discussions, new regulation? What do you sort of see? And kind of get, get all your opinions on that. I mean, I, I can quickly jump in. Um, so I think the first thing to do 
probably in any scenario where we're looking at these types of solutions is what are the greatest areas of potential impact, right? So where are the sec what are the sectors and what are the, the domains where we think that there's the greatest potential and, and let's start there and let's build partnerships actually to start to, to go, go after some of those opportunities. So energy is obviously itself a kind of key opportunity space. Transport um, is another one. And so how do you start to actually foster the partnerships to develop the solutions and then and then scale those, right? So that's sort of step one. Um, one, and we talked about this earlier, just as an illustration, um, our research team built a technology called uh, Contrails, which is basically focused on the aviation sector. Surprising to me, actually, after working in this space for 20 years, is that Contrails, sort of the plumes that you see in the sky behind an airplane, are responsible for about 35% of the global warming impact of the aviation sector, which is significant. And so basically, they, they partnered up with American Airlines and Breakthrough Energy to develop AI solutions that basically integrate into existing systems that pilots already use, but tell them how to kind of adjust the height um, of their, their airplanes, which is also something that they're commonly doing. Um, in order to avoid the creation of contrails in the first place, which in pilot testing has al already contributed to about a 50, 50, over 50% reduction um, in the creation of contrails. So these are the kinds of like no-brainer opportunity op spaces that that I think is are exciting to s explore. So look at those types of you know, these are problems, this specific solution can help. It's integrated into existing systems, which makes it relatively easy. I think this is another part of it, is how do you make it as easy as possible um, for these changes to happen? And then how do you demonstrate measurable outcomes? Um, and then how do you scale it? So, so this is a bit the journey, I think, where there's a lot of these types of optimization solutions that we can deploy quite quickly. Um, so that's, I think, where the start is, and doing that in sectors where there's the greatest potential for impact. So we think, obviously, energy, transport, and I already talked about adaptation, um, but also adaptation, I think, is critical as well from a people perspective and the ability to, to respond to the impacts that we already see. I concur. Um, that's what we're doing, too. We're looking at where we can have the highest impact, where, where are those grand challenge areas, and then convening the people, actually bringing the climate specialists in that area with the AI specialists doing some education and like, you know, understanding the same words and, and understanding both sides and then working towards solutions for highest impact and scale, so, yeah. Uh, in answer to your question about policy, Bill, yes, we need policy, absolutely. Uh, first, at the highest level of generality, we need strong climate change policies. Uh, AI is a tremendous innovation, but innovation doesn't necessarily mean low carbon innovation. AI tools we're talking about can certainly be used for um, you know, for fossil fuel production, they are being used for fossil fuel production. They aren't necessarily going to lead to low carbon development unless policy guides them towards low carbon development. So we need low carbon policies in this area, but more broadly. But then in, in addition to this kind of general low carbon policies, I think we need policies specifically focused at how do you use AI to promote low carbon development. Um, and, and those policies, I think, would be policies that promote development and standardization of data, and governments can play a big role in doing that. Training as well, um, a curriculum that helps to educate people in, in this area is probably the two most important areas. And it also feels like it's, it, it, there is certainly a cost to doing it. It costs money and it costs uh, people's time. So uh, also, the, you mentioned, you know, well, the equity issues, you know, I can see where the motivation is to do that from at a corporate level for things that, uh, you know, improve performance, get efficiency better. But for adaptation, certainly you're going to need a government or somebody to, to put the focus on that where there isn't as much money, right? I mean, I think one an additional way to think about that is, is sort of the prevention side of it as well, right? So, so if you take the example that I mentioned in terms of flood prediction, is what can be saved in terms of lives, infrastructure costs, and impacts through the deployment of solutions that actually help you forecast and predict before these types of extreme events happen um, is enormous. Uh, so I, th I think it's, it's the cost and the opportunity cost of not deploying some of these solutions that, that is helpful, I think, to factor into the equation um, as well. So just to kind of offer, um, let's say, the holistic cost perspective, I think, is equally critical here. And similarly, there's kind of an opportunity cost of not using the AI, because there could be a solution out there that you're pursuing without the AI, and the AI could 
actually accelerate or make it way more impactful to scale. I mean, another issue which I think should be raised um, is the bias issue. Um, and uh, this is an issue whenever large data sets are used and, and with AI. I mean, th there is a risk of bias either as a result of historic data sets being used that may not be relevant in the future or if the model isn't done correctly. Um, and the kind of classic example of this is a hiring tool that was used, um, I think by Amazon, um, that, that uh, discriminated against female applicants because historically ma male applicants had been hired. Um, and uh, I think it was even more specific that like people who had been on male sports teams were the most successful people. So, um, uh, b but th this risk applies when we're using data sets in the climate area as well and we need to pay attention to it um, and make sure the bias doesn't enter into um, uh, the use of these models. And, and just to mention sort of this and some of the issues that you mentioned previously, I mean at Google we have AI principles, right, which, which talk to some of these issues. Is as as AI is developed, how do you make sure that you know you are looking at bias, you are looking at privacy? And so I think the broad use of principles as these solutions are developed across the industry at large will be really important, I think, exactly to help ensure that these issues are kind of being thought about from, from the initial design of any of these types of tools and solutions as well. And sometimes it's, it's not intentional that people are saying, no, that's not important to us. Sometimes they're just not thinking about it or they're not even aware of these things. So it's part of it's the education as you're thinking about AI from the beginning. Um, and that's where these conversations are really helpful. And what's sort of the right way to push this out into the world? Is it, is it being still being pushed out mainly by the big companies like Google, like uh, the big AI companies? Um, or is there some other ways that this is going to find its way into the world? I mean, I think that the use, the use cases that are currently, that we're at least seeing and, and experiencing are all being done in partnership with others, right? Because, because there's a logic behind it, be it kind of optimization of energy systems, sort of rethinking grids in, in, uh, in countries or looking at this sort of contrails example because it is helping and providing solutions to those that are seeking those solutions, right? Be it an industry, be it governments. Um, so, so my sense is it will scale and it will be deployed through the increase of these partnerships in areas where there's a real um, opportunity to be had, be it, as you said, in the context of energy savings, but also emissions savings, um, financial savings, or from the perspective of response uh, for citizens to kind of really help them in the context of some of these impacts. Um, so, so that's where we see the greatest interest, I would say, um, in actually partnering and developing some of these tools and solutions. We make a very specific recommendation in our report in this area, and that is that every institution that has a role in climate mitigation should have an AI office or an AI advisor to the head of the organization to pay attention to this issue. And uh, in doing some research on this, I, was, I learned that the first chief information officer was it was uh, in 1981, uh, and interestingly, in the, the mainframe computers played a role in the 1960s and 1970s in businesses, but it wasn't until 81 that there was actually a chief information officer. Um, and these, a I think, um, AI is going to change so many things that any institution that's involved with climate mitigation should, in a very systematic and uh, organized way, be paying attention to this within their uh, corporate structure. I'll just add, I, I agree with everything, and um, the way we're thinking about it is it's a true collaboration. It's creating that ecosystem of the researchers, the entrepreneurs, the decision makers that all need to come together to make this happen. All right. Uh, is there anything else that somebody wants to throw out? Or I mean, actually, some more examples are, if you can think of some others, we got about two or three more minutes. Um, those really helped me, at least, get a, get a handle on the specific things. I know one from your report was, um, steel, uh, steel making, and how it could um, help with the, th that task. Talk about that for a sec. Uh, so electric arc furnaces are a way of decarbonizing the steel industry. They rely upon uh, scrap uh, metals, um, but uh, there's real challenges in terms of understanding the flows of the scrap metal into the electric arc furnaces and managing that process, and great success with using machine learning tools to better understand how to feed electric arc furnaces. Um, something that may be more intuitive for people is fertilizer application in agriculture. 
um, and there's a precision agriculture that uses machine learning tools which can um, optimize uh, the application of fertilizer which often emits greenhouse gases. Uh, and, and by the way, food waste also. So food waste is a major cause of greenhouse gas emissions um, with uh, consumption data, retail chains, and other places. We can work towards minimizing food waste with machine learning tools. Go David ahead, all. Mine. Um, one more I'll add is uh, speeding up permitting and deployment challenges. We know that there's so many projects that are ready to be deployed and permitting is kind of a, a hurdle in some senses. And so how can AI be used for thinking about everything from site selection to the biodiversity pieces of it um, to you know figuring out disinformation piece of, of the data as well. And I think you were in some areas of, of sort of adaptation and sort of flood water predictions, those yeah. things. Yeah, so I guess I've, I've given a few examples already, but indeed, so the flood hub is about sort of forward prediction of, of flooding, um, but also extreme heat. Uh, we have extreme heat alerts in search to help kind of provide information to people around the world about extreme, you know, extreme heating events, which we are seeing happening now in, in, in Brazil and other countries around the world. Um, Firewatch is another uh, tool that we've that we've developed is um, looking at how do you actually kind of detect fires uh, as early as quickly and there's been partnerships for many many years with organizations around the world like the World Resources Institute to look at Global Forest Watch to help kind of monitor and track uh, global deforestation and ideally obviously then prevent instances of deforestation um, so so yeah there's there's use cases I think across the board um, that we're already seeing, but I think to your point is is that opportunity for scale is where we're going to see I think the big impacts. I think one area that we didn't touch on was also um, sort of those breakthrough innovations that AI can help bring forward. Uh, we were discussing it a little bit earlier, but things like fusion, right? So how do you start to apply kind of mass analytics to help accelerate the innovation process to help unlock some of those you know arguably forward forward innovations in the system, as well as apply AI to help um, optimize the existing system. So I think it's at both ends of the spectrum um, that we sh can be thinking and are thinking in terms of the opportunity um, as well. And I'll give an example specifically to that in it, you know, how do we accelerate our innovation pipeline? Um, I think it was Schmidt Futures that just announced a, recently a new project that's about using AI to help scan the entire, you know, all of the research papers that exist in a certain topic. So researchers don't have to be spending all of their time reading everything that's out there, but but helping uh, harness that information and, and, and use that information more precisely. All right, I think that gets us to the end of our time. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, and stick around for the next session if you'd like. There is one, um, and look forward to seeing you at the Energy Transition Hub. Thanks.